Trump to surrender Tuesday with the approval of 60% of Americans. 15 million people could lose coverage as the Medicaid purge begins. U.S. banking turmoil likely to cause tightening conditions. Experts call for urgent repatriation of children in Syrian camps. 250,000 Palestinians defy Israeli curbs for prayers at Al-Aqsa. More than 50% of Swedes support a ban on Qur'an burning. France refuses to pause matches for Ramadan fast-breaking. Police host iftar for Muslims after report slams racism. From Toronto studios, this is the Muslim News on Muslim Network TV. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Samia Sayed. Our top story tonight, former President Donald Trump is extremely angry and his family is rattled, according to New York Times reporter Maggie Haberman. Trump was indicted last week by a Manhattan grand jury investigating a hush money payment made during his 2016 campaign to adult film star Stormy Daniels. Daniels was paid $130,000 by Trump fixer Michael Cohen in return for silence about an alleged 2006 sexual encounter with the then future president. On his Truth Social account, the 2024 Republican presidential candidate confirmed that he will be at court on Tuesday. CNN reports that 60% of Americans approve of Trump's indictment, according to a new CNN poll. More than two dozen women and a 13-year-old girl have accused Trump of sexual misconduct, including assault. Beginning Saturday, U.S. states will start stripping Medicaid coverage from millions of people as pandemic-related protections lapse. It's part of a broader unraveling of the safety net built to help families withstand the COVID-19 public health crisis and resulting economic turmoil. Medicaid's continuous coverage requirements kicked in, in early in the pandemic. They helped vulnerable people maintain insurance amid the health crisis. That resulted in record high Medicaid enrollment. But at the end of last year, congressional negotiators agreed to set April 1st as the beginning of the unwinding process for the continuous coverage mandates. It prevented states from conducting regular eligibility screenings for Medicaid recipients. The bipartisan deal gave states 12 months to determine who is eligible for Medicaid. Some states are jumping at the opportunity to quickly remove people from the program. Joan Ulker is executive director at the Georgetown Center for Children and Families. She tweeted on Friday, tonight at midnight, people in Arizona, Arkansas, Idaho, New Hampshire, and South Dakota will lose their Medicaid coverage. Residents of 10 states that have refused life-saving Medicaid expansion under the Affordable Care Act are likely to be hit hardest by the end of the continuous coverage requirements. The Biden administration estimates that it could result in 15 million people losing health insurance nationwide, including millions of children. The head of the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank of New York said Friday that the recent banking turmoil is likely to cause more stringent conditions for the American economy. John Williams said a tightening of credit conditions will reduce spending by businesses and households. He added, the magnitude and duration of these effects, however, is still uncertain. The U.S. banking industry has been shaken by the sudden demise of multiple institutions in recent weeks. That includes Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. Williams said about the Fed's aggressive rate hike to bring inflation down, lags exist between the Fed's policy actions and their effects. He explained that while the Fed's aggressive monetary tightening slows economic growth, that will likely lead to some softening in the labor market. For Muslim Americans, the breakfast anytime chain IHOP is a popular destination during Ramadan for the pre-dawn meal called suhoor. This Ramadan, the IHOP in Totowa, New Jersey, has introduced a new halal menu. It features chicken fajitas, grilled chicken with salad, and turkey bacon with pancakes made from halal poultry slaughtered and prepared according to Islamic law. Suhaib Jabran, a partner and manager at the restaurant, is himself Muslim. He said introducing the halal menu is something he always wanted to do. Jobrin has taken extra steps to ensure every ingredient is fully Sharia compliant. 
he makes sure cheese products are free of pork enzymes and that foods do not contain gelatin, which may be made with pork collagen. Defying Israeli restrictions, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians from the occupied West Bank marched to the Al-Aqsa Mosque for the second Friday prayers of Ramadan. Sheikh Azam al-Khatib, head of the Islamic Endowments Department in Jerusalem, told Anadolu Agency about 250,000 worshippers offered Friday prayers at Al-Aqsa Mosque. That was significantly higher than last week's 100,000 who prayed at Islam's third holiest site. Israeli authorities said 2,000 security personnel were deployed in East Jerusalem. Muhammad Ahmed Hussein, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, warned of Israeli plans to target Al-Aqsa Mosque during Passover. The Jewish holy period runs April 5th through the 12th. Jews called the area the Temple Mount, claiming it was the site of two Jewish temples in ancient times. Israeli forces barred men under 55 years old from the West Bank from entering Al-Aqsa Mosque. Israel has said it will only allow women, children, and men older than 55 to enter without a permit during Ramadan. A small number of people from the Gaza Strip have obtained permits to enter East Jerusalem during the holy month. At least 13 people were killed and several others injured following a stampede at a free ration distribution in Pakistan's southern port city of Karachi, local media reported. The victims include women and children. The incident occurred after people gathered at a factory in the city's industrial area to collect rations. That is part of charity drives locals hold every Ramadan to help the needy. Doctors have described the condition of several injured as precarious, fearing a rise in the death toll. Maurice Hashmi, a police official, said at least seven people responsible for organizing the distribution have been taken into custody as police were not informed beforehand. Similar incidents occurred in recent weeks during the distribution of free flower bags by the government in northeastern Punjab and northwestern Pakhtunkhwa provinces, killing several people. A story on United Nations experts calling for the urgent repatriation of children from northeast Syria comes with details after the break. So stay tuned and we will be right back. Welcome back. On Friday, United Nations experts called for the urgent repatriation of children from northeast Syria as they entered their fifth year of detention. They said children in conflict zones must be protected and not punished. Many of the children were detained by the de facto authorities following the fall of Baghouz in early 2019, experts said. They were talking about camps controlled by the YPG PKK terror group. Since 2019, more than 25 countries have repatriated their citizens from Syrian detention camps. Western countries have, however, been reluctant to bring home their nationals and family members suspected of joining ISIS in Syria. Experts said the two largest locked camps for women, girls and young boys, Al-Hol and Roj, are still holding around 56,000 individuals, including 37,000 foreign nationals. More than half of the camp's population are children, 80% come under the age of 12, and 30% are younger than 5. There are also more than 850 boys being held in prisons and other detention areas, and what are being called rehabilitation centers throughout northeast Syria. The Vatican on Thursday responded to indigenous demands and formally repudiated the doctrine of discovery. Last summer, Pope Francis formally apologized for the Catholic Church's role in Canada's residential school system. During his trip across Canada, there were also calls for the pontiff to repudiate the doctrine of discovery. These are theories that were used to legitimize the colonial era seizure of native lands. In July, in the Canadian province of Quebec, indigenous protesters unfurled a large banner calling for Pope Francis to rescind the doctrine. It was among the demands of the Truth and Reconciliation Report eight years ago. Dr. Matthew Wildcat, a member of the Ermanskin Cree Nation and an assistant professor at the University of Alberta, called it a humongous symbolic victory for Indigenous peoples. The head of the Indigenous Reconciliation Group believes the Pope's journey through Canada likely played a role in Thursday's development. 
Some 51% of Swedes support a ban on burning of the Quran and other holy scriptures, a survey revealed Saturday. While 34% say burning holy scriptures is freedom of speech and expression, 15% did not comment, according to the poll by research company Sippo. The survey was conducted March 14th to 16th with over 1,300 respondents. Public broadcaster SVT said provocative incidents by Danish far-right politician Rasmus Paludin against the Muslim holy book cost the country's treasury $8.5 million. Paludin, leader of the Stram Kurs political party, was surrounded and protected by the police when he set the Quran on fire in Sweden's capital Stockholm in front of the Turkish embassy in January. The act has since been condemned by many Muslim countries, including Turkey and various NGOs and human rights groups. The German capital of Berlin will allow Muslim teachers to wear headscarves, authorities confirmed Wednesday. Headscarves and the wearing of religious symbols by teachers will be permitted and can only be restricted in individual cases if it poses a danger to school peace, Berlin's education department said. Under Berlin's Neutrality Act, which prevents civil servants from wearing religious clothing and symbols, teachers in the city were banned from wearing headscarves since 2005. Several court rulings in recent years have underlined that a blanket ban on headscarves constitutes discrimination and violates religious freedom guaranteed by the Constitution. The Senate Department for Education, Youth and Family told school directors they should comply with the recent court rulings. Many are condemning France's football federation for its dismissal of Muslim players' religious obligations and physical well-being. Unlike English football leagues, France's football federation, or FFF, has refused to pause evening matches during Ramadan to allow Muslim players to break their fast. The federation has said it is due to the principle of football neutrality at the places of practice. In an email sent to French football officials, FFF's Federal Commission of Ref Referees has forbidden any match interruptions to allow Muslim footballers to break their fast. The commission said these interruptions do not respect the provisions of the statutes of the FFF. The Federation and its bodies defend the fundamental values of the French Republic and must implement means to prevent any discrimination or infringement of a person's dignity due to their political and religious beliefs, said the email. The FFF prohibits any display of a political, ideological, religious or trade union affiliation during its tournaments. The Federation warned failure to comply with these instructions will subject the violator to disciplinary and or criminal proceedings. The email concluded by calling on all football officials to ensure these provisions are respected. One of the London Metropolitan Police's most senior officers said an iftar event for Muslims is the force's last chance to regain public trust. Chief Superintendent Jeff Booth's comments came at the event this week at New Scotland Yard. It comes just days after a damning report found the London Metropolitan Police institutionally racist, misogynistic and homophobic. The 363-page report by Baroness Louise Casey identified a number of cases where female, gay or minority ethnic officers were abused or mistreated by colleagues. It also revealed widespread bullying, racist attitudes, and deep-seated homophobia. Booth addressed some of the concerns raised by the Casey report at the Iftar. He said, for many of us, the findings were not new. For many of us, we have been saying this for years. You can look at it as an opportunity to continue in the way we have been behaving for a number of years, or we can see this opportunity to bring about real change. Booth said the force was continuing to grow its community outreach work to attract the number of women and people from underrepresented groups to its ranks. Before we conclude today's news, I would like to extend a special request. It takes about 55 hours of work per day to produce this new segment for you. It brings news with a unique perspective, and you can find it only on here on Muslim Network TV. Sound Vision is a not-for-profit organization which produces it. And just like PBS or NPR, we depend on your donations. Please visit muslimnetwork.tv to donate now or click the link below to donate.
And that's all from our Toronto studios tonight. Thank you for tuning in. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell icon for the latest updates. For more content, keep watching Muslim Network TV or visit muslimnetwork.tv. Assalamu alaikum and good night.